Hey folks, hope that you're well. Thank you for listening. Welcome to episode number four. I think it'll be a fun one because we'll talk about the Rivian Adventure Network. Some news came out about that this week. First of all, if you want to support the show, please join us over at rivianstories.com, a place where you can get news and updates and join a community of fellow Rivian fans. Also, please check us out on YouTube and Instagram. Just search for Rivian Stories. We'd really appreciate, I would really appreciate if you follow us there. Uh, It helps for sure. Okay, so the lead story this week comes from an article published by TechCrunch about the Rivian Adventure Network. And this is exciting. And honestly, there wasn't much new to learn here, but it's just nice to see uh, RJ, especially in Rivian, kind of coming out in the public, so to speak, and making some statements. And they've already done that. In fact, I'm going to show a clip in a little bit from the Bloomberg article where really he kind of says a lot of this kind of off the cuff, a lot of what's been published in this article. But kind of the lead story that the article points to is that, you know, this adventure network, this charging infrastructure has a twist in that most people think of the charging network along highways, fast charging to get you through a long road trip. And they're saying that the twist is that Rivian's also going to have slower chargers at adventurous destinations such as mountain bike and hiking trails and kayaking spots and maybe even near, you know, popular climbing crags and stuff like that. You know, to those who have (laughs) been following Rivian for a long time, a little history lesson here is that at first when Rivian came out at the LA Auto Show and all the questions started coming in to the Rivian official Instagram account about charging RJ's response and uh, the official response from Rivian at that point was that they were going to really rely on the third-party networks such as Electrify America and all the others, but that they would be installing some chargers in some of the remote adventure locations. So those of us who have been following for a couple of years, it actually started with the twist. The twist to us now, in truth, is that these chargers are going to be coming to interstates. Uh, something more like the Tesla network or more like the third-party networks uh, that are designed to get you uh, cross-country to your longer destinations. And honestly, if you go back in time, a lot of people were asking Rivian to use Tesla's network because Tesla has always been open to bringing in other people into their network. Um, I remember uh, very well a lot of people in the Instagram comments saying, please use Tesla, please use Tesla, please use Tesla. That brings me to the next point, and honestly what I think the biggest point of this article is, why would people clamor for that? Because the reliability, the consistency, the quality of charging at these kind of, quote, public uh, third-party charge points was just horrible. There's story after story about... You get to a charging station with six plugs and five of them were not working or three of them were not working. And of the other three, it was crazy, crazy slow. And so a lot of people were like, this is going to be horrible. And then I specifically remember RJ at the beginning saying, you will be surprised at the rate of growth that will happen through the third party chargers in the future. And so people like me and many other like Tesla fans, for example, We're saying like, well, okay, maybe if these charging stations become so many that even though they're going to be low quality, maybe there'll be so many that that will kind of make up for it, so to speak. But to me, this is such great news as a Rivian owner that I'm not going to have to not only rely on a third party charging network, but the experience is going to be a lot better. And that brings us me to the most important part of this article. It's about controlling the experience. So let me scroll down here and try and find the quote here from RJ. And here it is. The challenge is we don't control those networks, those meaning the third party networks like ChargePoint and EV Connect and EVGo, Electrify America, Greenlots. Uh, they don't control the payment platforms, the uptime, the performance, the ability to reserve a charger. All those things that take the friction of charging away, we don't truly control, said Scringe. And then I'll keep going here. With the Rivian Adventure Network, this is again Scringe talking, we have 100% control of that. We get to know what vehicles are charging or how they're charging the rates. We can be really creative in terms of locations. 
So it can allow us to get to places that are very specific and unique to Rivian. Uh, that goes back to what we we're talking before about adventure destinations. But I can only imagine the talk in meetings behind the scenes of them listening to so many people saying, these third-party networks, sure, they're going to grow, but the experience is terrible. And then Rivian getting creative, knowing that they can take the experience to the next level. And that's what I want to go to next. And I want to play you a little clip from the Bloomberg article a few weeks ago that really kind of gives us a little hint of that next level. I'm just going to press play here. And along with that, uh, we're building out our, our charging infrastructure and what we call our Rivian Adventure Network. And essentially, the goal of that is to make it seamless, to make it easy to go anywhere, uh, whether that is you know, going out to the mountains for the weekend or, or you know, driving from Northern California to Southern California. Uh, we want to make those types of trips um, really sort of thoughtless. You don't have to worry about how you're going to charge it, where you're going to charge it. And for that reason, we took the decision to vertically uh, build a charging solution and a network uh, in-house. So how does that work in practice? I'm, I'm driving up to Tahoe for the weekend. It's a long way for me to go from the Bay Area. Talk to me about how I would charge my vehicle on the go under the system that you guys are looking at. Well, first, we're using a, a charging standard that's that's common with essentially all vehicles. Uh, it's called the CCS standard. So this allows the vehicles to use other third-party networks, uh, and there's a number of them. But our feeling is that the the, the value of creating our own our own CCS network is that we can really ensure the customer experience, payments platform, availability, charging speed, uh, your ability to reserve charging slots or know the vehicle knows it needs to be charged in those locations, makes it really seamless. So if you're driving from the Bay Area to, to Tahoe, uh, along the way you stop, you pull in, um, you pull the charger out, you plug it in the car and the rest you know takes care of itself. Um, you're, you're not worried about payments, you're not worried about uh, you know, connecting with the charger, making it, which is very simple, plugs right in. And then when you're setting out on that trip, you'd say, these are the types of things I'd like to do at the stop. I'm looking to get some food. I'm looking to go for a hike. And depending on your preferences, we would direct you to different charging locations. So if you've ever had a conversation or if you just kind of pay attention to your conversations going forward with people who are considering becoming first time EV owners, one of the main questions and concerns, and it's a legit concern, is charging. So people want to know how do you charge overnight and how much that gets you. That's one thing. But people especially want to know how you charge for a longer destination, a road trip. We're so used to gassing up in three minutes. And so I can't overstate as far as the adoption of going to EV, how important it is to have this experience right. So I just give kudos to Rivian for thinking of and creating a way to where even though the charging experience is going to be longer than gas, at least it becomes an enjoyable, seamless experience. So if I go from Springfield to Nashville, and I know that that usually takes me just under six hours, and now with an EV, it's going to take me six hours and 40 minutes because of charging or six and a half hours because of charging. That's one thing, but it's a whole nother if I know that it's going to be fun and seamless. You know, if those charging breaks aren't going to be a headache and aren't going to be stressful. And so I am very excited as a pre-order holder that they are going in this direction. I also want to speculate a little bit here. Um, I don't think that the change of tune from two years ago from third party public networks into the private Rivian Adventure Network has been made possible only by the billions of dollars of cash that they now have on hand. Uh, it's almost made possible as much or more than anything, I think, because of the Amazon deal, the 100,000 vans. And uh, no joke in here, three weeks ago, I talked about this in my response to the HyperChange guy saying that Rivian has the wrong focus by focusing too much on the vans and that they're kind of not focusing on the vehicles enough and how he was kind of worried about that. In that episode, I actually said that I think that there will be a benefit in terms of charging just because of the intellectual property you get to keep those Amazon vans charged and going could carry over into the um, 
consumer side of charging. And I left it out because, you know, I record these things for 40 minutes or an hour, and then I try and edit them down to 20 minutes. And so I left it out. I wish that I would have left it in because it would have made me sound very smart. I could have maybe fooled you guys into thinking I was smart, but I didn't. But now is a good time to come back around to that point. And to try and give it a little bit of a finer edge, I'm not saying that the charging infrastructure for the Amazon vans is going to be the same locations or anything like that. Obviously not. We know that the charge points for the Amazon vans are going to be somewhere close to those ship stations. What Rivian has to learn in order to keep those 100,000 vans charged and on the roads, they'll be able to take those same lessons, surely, and apply it to the truck and to the SUV. And so he hints at that in this article too. I'm going to scroll up here. Here's where he says that. If you think of commercial vans, what does that sound like? The charger and the dispenser may look a little different, but the guts of these power modules that are used to build up the charging capability are identically applied in these very different applications. It's one of the reasons we built out all that core competency. So we could build both fleet size B2B charging solutions, Amazon delivery vans, and the consumer facing adventure network for Rivian customers. So there you have it. Again, I wish I would have left this in a few weeks ago, but the point is still the same. This is just one example of the great benefit we receive as consumers for the truck and the SUV as a result of the Amazon delivery van deal. I'm sure that there are many other benefits as well. So let's wrap this little segment up with how quickly this Rivian Adventure Network will grow and in typical fashion, Scaringe would not say exactly how many charging stations would be open by this coming summer when the first deliveries come out. But he noted that dozens of charging stations would be available with the average of six uh, charging connectors per station in 2021. And then he said a great point, as that network is built, it will take some of the pressure off of the need to have very large battery packs. Great point there. And they end with saying that even without specific numbers, it's clear that RJ's aspirations and plans extend well beyond dozens of Rivian stations. Quote, the scale of a network is not something that you can turn on overnight, he said. It takes months of time to get full coverage of the U.S. and years of time to get dense coverage, which by 2023 or 2024, we will certainly have. So when you look at that map and Next year, it might be a little bit laughable compared to Tesla standards, but it's going to look more dense by 2023 20, or 2024. And another thing I'll say, I guess, is one more thing to say here is that when Tesla, kudos to Tesla, when, when they built out their network, they really needed it. There were not a lot of third-party uh, options out there. And so that network was crucial. The Rivian network won't be as crucial from getting point A to point B, but it will certainly be crucial in terms of a seamless experience. So again, it's all uh, super exciting. Okay, the next story that I want to touch on here just came out yesterday from Chicago Business. Your next car will probably be an electric pickup truck. <laughs> With their mass appeal, automakers say selling battery-powered models should be a breeze if they ever get made. And really the big point here is that People who buy trucks in the USA right now aren't just your farmers and cowboys and ranchers and all that. I mean, they really come from everywhere. This uh, story goes into, you know, like a middle-aged mother buying one in the city because they're so convenient to pick up uh, things every now and then. And really what RJ says here is that we're seeing customers come out of just about everything. Of course, they're coming out of pickups, but often and more likely coming out of SUVs and out of other electric vehicles. So the article goes on really to basically say that trucks are the biggest selling segment in the American market, and that's with you know gas guzzler trucks. And how much more then will uh, the adoption rate for trucks continue once they're much more efficient in terms of, quote, gas mileage, in terms of the cost to operate from point A to point B, as far as energy goes. And so also play into that, and I was talking with a buddy this week, that when you look at a car, like a Tesla Model S that's $100,000, you can get such a nice car for 30 or 40 grand. And so the Tesla Model S is so much higher. When you look at trucks and SUVs, I mean, just from your good old Ford and GMC trucks and 
your Tahoes for your SUVs, you can easily spend 70 and 80 grand on those by, you know, kind of maxing them out, sometimes even more. And those aren't from your quote luxury brands. And so I think that part of what this article is saying is that America has already proven the demand for this size and utility of a vehicle, meaning a truck and or a proper SUV, like a true SUV. I don't consider the Model Y an SUV. It's more like a car that's a little tall. I definitely consider the R1S an SUV. And so there's a big market here. And when you add in the cost advantages of powering that by electricity instead of gas, they're basically just saying that they think that they will sell very well. And the challenge here is at the very top if they ever get made. And uh, thankfully, I think that Rivian is going to do it. All right, the next story I just want to touch on, skim over it. It's not that exciting, but it came out this week that Rivian is going to lease an additional 500,000 square foot warehouse in normal. And for some reason, when I scroll down on this article, I can't see anything. So I'm just going to have to do this from memory. But I remember that it was basically six miles or so east of the Rivian factory. And they were planning on using it for inbound logistics, uh, for parts, for receiving. Um, I'm pretty sure that they were expected to, I don't think it's even done yet. Uh, I think that reading on Reddit or somewhere, it was, it, it kind of paused construction because the person building it went to prison or something like that. But so they're going to have to continue building it out like yeah, this spring and that interior work was scheduled for maybe this summer or something like that. So it's not like they're moving in, but it's definitely an additional 500,000 square feet. So interesting there. Okay. Last story here is just a little update on how to find your pre-order number. I kind of gave you instructions on this a couple weeks ago, which was basically to go into your configuration summary and look up at your URL and look at the number after order in minus 2220. And several people right away in that first day sent me messages over at rivingstories.com saying that they had some huge number, like, you know, eight or nine digits long. So they didn't really feel like that was too accurate. And obviously I would agree. So I went digging around deep into forums. I think it was over at Rivian forums on page 20 of something. And I found this, that if your pre-order was after August, 2020, then it isn't a terribly useful number. What I've pointed you to, they adjusted the numbering system at that time. I don't think we've collected enough uh, data to determine if there's a pattern to be uh, that we can adjust the numbers and kind of figure out the truth again. But that said, if you ordered after August 2020, it appears as if you're going to have you're going to get a pretty high number, and you know this isn't going to help at all. Like for example, uh, there's a number here that someone gave me that is two seven five five eight six seven eight nine. <laughs> so and that was ordered at it was ordered in November 2020. So they're obviously trying to scramble that for us. So just a little update there. All right, guys, that is it for this one. But the good news is that I'm going to release an additional episode before next weekend. Yesterday, I interviewed Lacey of Miss Go Electric about the house bill in Michigan that is trying to prevent Tesla and Rivian and future uh, automobile companies, electric or otherwise, that want to sell directly to consumers. They're trying to nix that. So I had Lacey on, who's uh, very involved in this and very knowledgeable, and she explains it all, why the players involved, and I will try and release that early next week. Uh, and in the future, if you have any other ideas of people to interview, please let me know. Uh, that's mainly what I want to do, is interview people. Uh, I would honestly rather not be a news roundup guy. I would rather interview people and tell stories from pre-order holders to Rivian teammates themselves and everyone in between. So if you have ideas of people, or maybe you want to be interviewed because you're an expert, please let me know. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you again for listening. And please, if you could support the show by visiting rivianstories.com and signing up, it's completely free, or by following us on YouTube or Instagram. That helps us out a lot to build the audience. So thank you very much.